Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm Chad Bruckner. Welcome back to the Breaking Bad Show. Ryan and I just love having you on this journey, and I'm sorry I have my shaky camera up with no tripod. I'm sitting on my front porch, and I have birds nesting and pooping everywhere on my porch. I'm trying to deal with that. Today's guest is Cindy Doyle. She is a licensed marriage therapist counselor. She has an amazing story. She's married to a first responder, a police officer. And this is a topic we do not talk about in law enforcement. Marriage and loyalty and relationships is a core value of mine. So when I remember sitting around the squad room or talking with other police officers about this topic, it always seemed to just be something nobody wants to talk about. I couldn't take it as, is it not important to them? Uh, are they being disloyal behind my back so they don't want to discuss something that could be hurtful to them? I don't know what it is, but this is a topic we need to talk about. Uh, there are tons of divorce and infidelity in law enforcement, tons of broken marriages. This job is already hard enough. We need support at home from our loved ones, and that requires us to be giving just as much as our spouses. So we can't wait to have Cindy on. This interview went longer than we expected. This is the first time in show history we had to re-record because we just didn't get everything in. And in, in the post-interview, we just kept talking about it. So we hit record again and, and added more value to your life by getting more content on here. So we hope you really love the show. We keep growing this thing for you. This is about you and adding value to your life and your career. So without further ado, let's bring on Cindy Doyle. This is the Breaking Bad Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Bad Show. I'm Ryan. Hey, everybody. I'm Chad. And we're super excited for the guest that we have on the show today. Our guest today is a relationship and mental health expert for first responders. Her husband was a first responder for approximately 21 years. Um, she has a podcast called Code 4 for Couples, and she's also written a book, called Hold the Line, the Essential Guide to Protecting Your Law Enforcement Relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the show, Cindy Doyle. Welcome to the show, hey, Cindy. Hey, Cindy. Hey. What's how are y'all guys? Good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I think it was Chad was saying that he always says super excited every single time. Oh, I, I say that. Oh, it's you, Ryan. Sorry. I'm trying to get your voices right because I listen. I don't watch. So oh, God. I'm going to have to change it to wicked excited, right? <laughs> wicked excited, man. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Cindy, I got to say, out of all the guests we've had on, and they're all amazing and, and provide a lot of value, I don't know why. I mean, I know why, but I'm really, I was just really, really excited to have you on because we're going to talk about stuff today that so many first responders don't want to talk about. They don't want to think about it. When I try to bring this up with them, uh, to help them just kind of be a good peer when I was on the job and a mentor and, and, and kind of coach them through some of their personal stuff. It was always the one topic, the ones that we had great relationships, but you know, on the side, they're doing dirty things they're, and they're just, the, the water is so muddy and then they can't figure out why they can't get out of their own way sometimes. And uh, that, that is something I really want to dive in with you. And if you don't mind real quick, starting us off with, how did you get into this? Like, what was your passion and motivation to, to bring you forward to what you're doing now? So the big part of my passion and motivation was mostly my own relationship with my husband. And um, I hit a wall about 13 years into our relationship where I was just pissed. Um, I felt like the department always came first. I was always like a side thing. Um, now, he, I, he's a great guy. He made me feel loved. He told me he loved me. He would do kind things. But it was always, it was always a cho choice between me or the department. The department won. Um, it was like it was just always running in the background. And I just got really pissed and irritated. I think the, and the other aspect of this is that we saw a lot of couples that were getting divorced um, we started hearing things about what they were doing. We weren't necessarily experiencing that, but we were just so disconnected. Um, as a counselor, uh, I was working with couples in my therapy room and I was like, what the hell? Why can't, why can't I make my relationship the way I'm making other people's relationship work? And it was then that I really started to dig in and figure out, 
Um, is there something different about our relationships as first responders? And there is a plethora of differences that nobody had been talking about. I think now we're starting to talk about it a little bit more, but back then, I feel like I'm old, back then, um, we weren't talking about, we weren't talking about these things. And I found um, Gil Martin's book, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement. And I was like, oh, 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 is he in my house? Like, this is all the shit that happens in my, can I swear? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Talk like, what you want. This is, this is all the shit that happens in my house. Um, and so I was, I started working with first responders in my office more, and I realized that I wanted to make a bigger impact than just being in my office. And so I started thinking about how can I reach other first responders, other first responder couples. And that's when I started doing the podcast, uh, because I thought, okay, it's something that maybe they would listen to at night, like they're bored. Maybe they would listen to a podcast and that's how it kind of started, um, I was actually the part of the story is I was in a deer blind and it was very boring that morning, nothing going by. So yeah, I just thought, well, what can I do to impact more lives? And so that's how I kind of got into it. Like why go through this journey and struggle if you can't use it for something else? Like it's almost like the basics of resiliency, right? Is like, how do I make purpose to this story and to the struggle that I'm having? And so that's why I wound up moving into Code for Couples and um, going that direction. I love it. I think that mission is just so important. And, and we need more of that in the first responder profession because it's just something we don't talk about. When you were, when you were counseling and, and coaching couples before you started to really grasp what was going on in your marriage, what were the common themes or what, what things were you seeing the most common that were contributing to their dysfunction? I assume we're talking first responder couples, correct? Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> every couple comes into my office and they come in with one of two problems. There's been emotional or, or physical infidelity, so some kind of an affair, or they have quote unquote, and if you're listening, I'm doing my air quotes, air quotes, communication problems. And so many times what would happen is that they were fighting all the time. And so it was that fighting communication problems, or they were uh, disconnected and cheating on their spouses, like doing something on the side. Um, the other struggles with first responders is, um, first responder couples that I see is a difference in figuring out how do we integrate when a first responder comes home after shifts and they have two ways of different doing things. Um, those are, I'll stop there because I was like, I can go on and on, but hey. there's other issues. There's other underlying issues that I figured out along the way, but those were the issues that people would come in with and they would think that they needed to communicate better or they needed to heal from infidelity. Um, other so, issues that yeah, give it, give us those way, other, ones. I'm curious what those other ones are. Cause I think that's just as important. So right? other issues along the way is what I call the sparkly object syndrome. So sparkly object syndrome um, is a, it's that whole thing of like something like I need to go do something or I need to be, I need to be entertained. And the underpinning for that is this uh, cortisol that goes through the system all the time. And I need to, I need to do something. I need to be going and the brain gets conditioned. And so sparkly object syndrome could be like, talking to other girls online or opposite sex online, or I'm going to constantly be engaged with somebody um, from the department in some way. Um, spending money is another way of the sparkly object. So people would wind up in debt and they were had financial differences and difficulties, um, which then starts that cycle of I'm going to work off duty and then I'm never home but I'm never home because I'm spending money, like the whole problem in the cycle. Um, of, course, of course, another sparkly object syndrome is going to be like alcohol. Um, you know, there's all these kind of like hits that we, or excitement we want to take. Um, so that's a big part of it. Um, the other one, the other problem that I think is just not understanding what goes on as a spouse, really being able to stand in your shoes as a first responder or being able to see and understand what really happens um, and, and the vice versa of that, of like, what's it like in our world? 
too. What's it like to be lonely? What's it like to kind of show up as a single parent when, or a single person when you're married and people kind of giving you a hard time about, well, are you really married? Is that really your spouse? Oh, you know, you know, law enforcement wise, we hate cops. Oh, but your husband's not bad. Like all those kinds of experiences that we have, but then also really understanding what's going on with yours. I mean, my husband worked hard to protect me from some of that the first 10 years and I wish he would have shared it. So I would have understood how he was being impacted. Uh, that's interesting. Um, we talk a lot about mental health and, and the stigma in law enforcement and, and first responders and the military community of, of how strong that stigma is and how that prevents us, a lot of us from speaking up. And I'm curious what your, your answer is, your take on this, but some of the things I found with some of my friends and colleagues that have been, have not been faithful and some of those conversations, some are willing to talk about it and kind of acknowledge it and try to work on it. Some really a lie or ignore it, even though it's kind of assumed. So I'm, I kind of found there's a lot of shame that gets probably like any other addiction or any, a lot of shame that gets attached to it or fear of judgment. You know, is that an issue that you saw that kind of holds up a lot of marriages from, from really working on the details? Absolutely. Because what um, that struggle is because what I, the majority majority. There's always that slim other percentage of people that are like, I don't care. Um, but the majority of, I'm not going it, to, it overarches besides just first responders, but the majority of individuals who have a affair are not necessarily wanting to be in the affair. It's a slow slide. And so it's a shame of getting away from their morals, from their values, uh, the shame of how that looks. Um, many times people have a, have a hard time stopping, you know, you develop an emotional connection with that individual. And so then you're going to hurt that person. Then there's also fear of what's going to happen. And so when you hide behavior, um, I always think of it like the, I don't know why I pick on Chinese food, but it's the Chinese food in the back of the fridge that you forgot about from the takeout restaurant. And it starts to get moldy and smells and it starts infiltrating um, the rest of your world and your relationship. And so when we hide any behavior, whether that is an affair or drinking or inappropriate, uh, something that we feel shameful about, it winds up almost infecting the rest of us and it comes out sideways. It comes out, um, it continually like drives us away from where we want to be because our, our body is so wanting to hide that secret from us or hide the secret from everybody else. And so definitely shame is a big part of it. Um, so then the other aspect of that is like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about how what I've done hurt you mm -hmm. as my spouse. And so I'm just pretending it didn't happen. And I'm going to, I have a story about that if y'all want, but yeah. um, okay. So I, I have a couple that they went through, he, she had an affair. The spouse had an affair because 50, 50 chance spouses cheat as much as first responders do. Um, so she had an affair and the first responder just wanted to get over it. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about his pain. He didn't want to talk about his hurt. She didn't want to talk about the shame. She didn't want to be a bad person either. And so um, they had a couple of sessions with me and they're like, oh, we've decided we're just going to go renew our vows. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, and so, so they go off crazy. and they go off and they renew their vows and they don't, uh, really unpack it. And it was probably about six or eight months later, he came in and he said, I have become somebody I don't want to be because I am so angry with her and I can't forgive her, which somebody did a forgiveness episode just recently, I believe. Right. Um, and so I can't, I can't forgive her and it's made me angry and I hit her. And so now I've become the perp. I've become the guy that I go arrest for domestic violence. And like, it, it just like went way off course. And so then they came back in, we unpacked it. We shared what was not working. Um, he moved to forgiveness. Uh, they then shared why the affair kind of happened and occurred. And it's never anybody's like, it's that affair partner's responsibility but many times there are underlying issues. So underlying connection issues. You don't get me, you don't get my world. You come home and you are a curmudgeon. 
my episode this week is a curmudgeon. Um, so you're a curmudgeon and you're crusty and you're irritable and your mindset is shit. And so therefore I don't want to connect with you and you come home and you're controlling and trying to boss me around. So all of this stuff had to get unpacked. And that is a lot of what I see many times in relationships that aren't working is that spillover winds up impacting the family and the relationship. Hmm. So one thing I, that I, I struggle with more than anything is um, I've always tried to put myself in the shoes of somebody else to understand what path they've walked, where they're coming from. Uh, I feel like that is a, a skill that I've just uh, learned to acquire. Maybe I was born to, I don't know. But so I really am good with everything in the world to put myself in their shoes and really dig in and evaluate. Okay, I can understand how that happened. Infidelity is the one thing I just, it's not that I want to judge it. I just, I, I, I can't put myself in those shoes. I don't know what that feeling is like, that emotion. I can't even imagine it. You know, I mean, I can't tell many police officers I know that are in affairs, but then we're hanging out, joking around like, hey man, let me show you a picture of my kid. And they bring up the phone and I'm thinking like, I know like last night or two nights ago, you're in a hotel room with your mistress and you're showing me kids and your wife's in the picture. You know, it's just, I, I, how do you separate that? Like how, I just don't understand. And uh, is it a mental health issue? Is it, is it, what have you found that, that is contributing to this ability to amazingly separate all these lives? I don't think it's really a mental health issue. I think it is a connection issue. So if I feel connected to my spouse, if I am getting what I need from my spouse, if I am feeling heard, understood, they um, are appreciating and valuing me, um, all of the aspects that go along with that is usually what protects the relationship. Um, John Gottman has done, a, Dr. John Gottman has done a lot of research on what makes couples work, and he has several elements that go into protecting this relationship. Um, and without that, kind of those windows get opened and there winds up being cracks that kind of get through. Part of it that I think first responders are more susceptible to is that that sparkly object hit is what I'm going to say is it's like it feels good to be complimented. It feels good to get that hit in the brain. So what we're kind of talking about is a conditioned response that uh, the brain reacts, right? So as a first responder, or even in the military, right? Because we're talking about military as well, that many times our brains or your brains are trained to react. So something happens, it goes. So there's a cortisol dump. And so along with that, there's a lot of activity that happens in the brain. And so the brain is looking for, hey, how can I get that hit? And so when that happens, it's kind of a slow slide. Very rarely do people go like, you're hot, let's go have sex. Like that's not how it works as far as an affair. It's a slow, slow slide. So you and I start talking and I see that there's some kind of connection or you compliment me or you touch me or I touch you, you know, right? So we start to have a little bit of connection. I'm like, ooh, that feels good. Um, and so most of the time affairs start off as emotional. We want to spend more time with that person because we're getting more hits in our brain. That doesn't mean, you know, it's just like any other, um, I'm not going to say it's an addiction, but it, the biological process is kind of the same. So just because somebody is like, oh, you know, I'm really looking forward to having that next drink or uh, taking that next flight off a plane and jumping, you know, it's, it's that feeling that comes with it. That doesn't mean that they don't want to be who they, who they see themselves at their core. And I think that's kind of the split is that the brain drives one behavior. And then before they know it in that slow slide, you wind up in a situation where you're like, how the hell did I get here? Mm. This isn't where I wanted to be. I'm in deep. How the hell do I get out? And is, that's, that's critical juncture. Is that, so basically, you, and I'm learning from you as you're saying this, so you can turn that off and on. And I, I asked this because I kind of always thought, or at least played some of it, like that emotional connection. I agree with that, that emotional, you're getting something and man, that's like mm -hmm. lighting a fire inside of you and that leads to something else. Right. Is, have you found from your experience, you know, because a, a lot of first responders, a lot of veterans that I know personally that, that are engaged in that, that are, they live by strict code, strict values. Uh, they are very loyal. They do have a, a high work ethic. They are very virtuous. 
yet there's that part of their life. And it's just like, it kind of always made me feel like there's a mental health component or addiction component. Is it just that simple as you, you can't, you know, you shouldn't do it and you do it anyway. Yeah. It's just like anything else that we do and shouldn't do anyway. I mean, I shouldn't eat a bag of Cheetos, but I do. Right. So there is though, there are those components where it's like, I know this isn't good for me. I know this isn't taking me down the path. Um, my brain is driving it. So that's, that's a lot of the push pull that the brain wants to get something from it. So it feels good. And so the brain is like, let's do things that feel good. Um, and it's not a matter of like, oh, you don't have willpower. It's, it is hard. Like it's like sitting on hands. It's grief to not be able to decide like that is not healthy for me. There is, you already hit one of them, Chad, you said the shame, right? So now I feel bad. And so sometimes in order to get rid of the shame, we just like slide back into bad behavior. Um, or sometimes with the shame, we like beat ourselves up. We go into depression, um, or anxiety about things. Um, and it, and it just kind of, it's a struggle. It's not as easy as people think to just get out of it because there is an emotional connection. And so there's grief. Um, when we look at addiction or addicts, you know, there's a grief about the relationship that individuals have with, I'll, I'll just use alcohol, alcohol, it's thinking about it, right? So I'm thinking about the next time that I'm going to have that experience with that person or alcohol or whatever it is, right? So I'm thinking about it. And so then my body gets prepped for it. And it's, it's a whole process uh, that our brain engages in. And so stopping that process takes a lot of uh, not just fortitude, but courage mm. um, because it's really uncomfortable and our brains don't like to be uncomfortable. Our brains like easy and comfort. <laughs> wow. I, I'm blown away because I'm just thinking about all these situations in my life or just people I know and I'm listening to you talk and I'm like applying, I'm attaching those to faces in my head as you're saying it. it, it it's, it's, it's really sad because I feel our, our families take this ride with us. And especially if you have three, four kids, and it's like they are on this yo-yo, they are on this ride. I mean, I know some first responders that are, they have older children and I know their older children know their dad or mom cheated. And like, how does that affect their family, if we know about it and it's kind of known in the community, how do the kids not know it? So, but seeming on the outside, it's a very healthy family. It's just, a, it's an interesting dynamic to me. And one, I really, I can't relate to it. I'm trying, I try my best when I talk to somebody, uh, but I'm talking to a friend now as a police officer and, he, and we're talking about that. And I don't have any advice. I just tell him, I think it's wrong. I think you need to reevaluate your life. I think you need to collaborate with your wife if you really love her and figure out how can you fix that? And that'll hopefully fix the other issues. But it, it's hard. It, it definitely doesn't seem like an easy fix. So that's why you got to go to Cindy Doyle and get help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think part of what you're hitting too, is this idea of like, it's, it's hard to have empathy because that's kind of what you're talking about is having empathy, being able to stand in somebody's shoes. And so it, it's a defense mechanism. Many times are like, no, no, dude, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine doing what I'm doing. That's a defense mechanism. And many times I, I don't know very many people that are like, oh no, no, no. I'm cool cheating on my spouse. Like I'm good with it. It's all good. Like that's just a defense mechanism, yeah. but they're unwilling to look at themselves and go like, wow, this, because the, a lot of times the, the other side is shame as opposed to what they need to do, which is have some self-compassion. Like, this is hard. This isn't where I want to be. God, this sucks. Who is it that I want to be? And how do I get help? Or how do I change this? Um, it's easier just to go with the flow. It's easier just to uh, kind of fall into those bad patterns, even if you don't want to fall into those bad patterns. I had a platoon sergeant in the army and uh, th this resonated with me. And you'll probably think this is a funny story, but I was 24 years old, single. I am single. Uh, now, I never never really had a long-term girlfriend, but the ones I did, I never I never cheated on a girlfriend or anything like that, but I kind of just went from girl to girl. But, um, but I'm 24 years old, single, no kids. I mean, I, this he's not talking to me, but yet I'd listen to other people's lessons, good or bad, because I, I've always listened to it because I, I don't know a lot, and I figure, figure out my way based on what other people do. But he, would, he was married and divorced three times. He would tell this story and he's very animated. He's like, gentlemen, we're all, all male infantry unit. Let me tell you something. You married folk, you're going to get a girl that's going to bat her eyes at you. She's going to make you feel good. 
You might they do some innocent flirting in your mind. It's not a big deal. Fast forward down the road. That's going to lead to some meet up at a hotel. This is amazing. It's, it's passionate. You're loving it. You're going to lay her down on the bed. You're going to you're going to start to foreplay and have this, all these great moments. And 20 minutes later, it's over because who are you kidding? You're not rock stars. You're not adult film stars. This thing will be over quicker than you actually think. But on your drive home. It's going to hit you. Mm -hmm. You're going to think about it. You're going to carry the shame in your heart. You're going to walk in the door and not want to give your spouse a kiss because you know what you were doing. Anyway, he goes in the story and I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh my God, this sounds awful. You know? And he's like, and I've been married three times to divorce and I did the same thing every time. Do not do what I did. I remember standing there in formation. I'm like, I am not doing that. But that story resonated. And I'm thinking like, still looking back on it. That was almost 20 years ago of, that story still rings true. And mm -hmm. I guess it's just, everyone's got their different code to operate on, but it's just, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to keep your personal life together, your marriage and be successful at work. I don't see how they, they go hand in hand. I don't think so. There's two things. Yes, you're exactly right. It's a trick, right? Because you start fantasizing, but then you don't actually live with that person. And so the brain thinks, oh, it's all wonderful. And it's like, no, oh, it's not wonderful. So that's one. The other thing I wanted to mention, because I was thinking about this as I finished up last my last comment was the, I want, I don't want to say like the new thing. Um, I am seeing more and more that first responders are getting on dating apps or hookup apps, whatever you want to call them, or uh, like DMs, right? So I had a guy, he contacts me every now and then um, on Instagram DM. And he's like, Cindy, this badge bunny is after me and I'm trying to avoid her but it's just so tempting. I want to talk to her, but I'm talking to you instead. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, talk me off the ledge. And I'm like, okay. But that's what I'm seeing more and more is it's like, I know I shouldn't be here, but I just want to see how many likes I can get if I put my face out there. And, and, and it winds up being hurtful to a relationship because now I'm saying like, do you like me? And, and mentally it's like, I just want to see if I can get likes. And I'm like, yeah, that's a slow slide. So, yeah, no, that's a good point. And I feel like the internet has made things so convenient. If that's, you know, that that's the, your shtick. I mean, that's the internet is, I mean, for anything really drug use. I mean, you know, the, the, the dark web, anything that you'd want to do that CD, you know, the internet is giving the ability to be more anonymous and, and confidential. Yeah. Cindy, I, earlier you mentioned that um, it was about 13 years in your marriage that you started to realize really that something, something had changed. And even in your, uh, in your bio that you sent over, you know, you wrote one thing really stood out to me and that was it. You said you knew there was something different about your relationship. Now, I guess my first question is, were you, were, were you and your husband married before he was a police officer or was he already involved in, in law enforcement? So we met, you know, I'm a counselor. So we met and he didn't like his job. And so I was like, oh, really? What have you wanted? What did you want to do with your life? And so he's like, I think I wanted to go into law enforcement. I was, you should totally go into law enforcement. And so he went through the academy while we were engaged. Uh, he was interviewing. Uh, we walked down the aisle. Um, we got off the plane from our honeymoon. And his mother said, um, I think this department wants you. They called everybody that you know to check on your background. So I have been with him since day one of his career. Wow. <laughs> so, so, so you've been there for, for that whole time. Yeah. The whole okay. time. So now when that, you know, when it hit that point that you knew there was something different, you recognized it. Could he, he could he tell too? Did he realize the same thing? No, he, he didn't recognize it at all. It's kind of that when you're many times when you're in a mental state. So when you're talking about um, mental health aspects, right, you can be in a place where people are like, good God, you're so negative, or wow, you're really struggling, you're like, or, or whatever, right? And, and they're like, no, I'm fine. I'm handling it just fine. And I'm like, no, you are burning on fire and you just don't see it, right? It's that kind of an aspect where we just become so conditioned to, or he was, he was really, um, he was so conditioned to being and thinking and doing a certain thing. And uh, it wound up like he didn't see it 
at all. And it took, it took years. Like I was the one who saw it. I was the one who decided to do something different and he'll say it. He's in the other room behind me, by the way. (laughs) Um, So he would, he would tell you the same thing. He's like, no, Cindy's the one who led that. Like, I'm the one of like, I, I don't care if you change, but I'm not going to continue down this path. I'm going to interact with you differently. I'm going to set boundaries with you. Um, I am not going to be talked to in a mean manner. I am not going to be disrespected. And so I started changing the way I was interacting with him as opposed to reacting the way. And so it wasn't, it was probably, oh, maybe I would say, let's see, we're, we're celebrating our 22nd anniversary, um, next month, this month, next week. Holy crap. Okay. So next week we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. anniversary. Thank you. Um, So it was probably about four or five years ago that he started going, oh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Um, So it it took a while for him to see it. And it was only probably, uh, I would say three or four years ago that he started opening up and seeing that like, oh, mental health is really a thing. And I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> so we, some of our greatest conflicts were, was about mental health. <laughs> it's still a battle inside the profession. A lot of people still don't believe it. Yeah. And, and that's incredible. And, you know, one thing I say is that you guys continue to stick with each other. Whereas we see divorce is so prevalent. I, I had been to, you know, in, in my career, I went to weddings and then saw the officer go through the divorces all in, all in my, yeah. you yeah. know, all the, within a couple of years, everything. So for you two to be able to stick together and not, and for one to not, for you to not say, you know, I can't deal with you anymore. You're not changing it. Or for him to say, I'm not, I don't like these boundaries you're, you're setting on and just saying, let's split. That's commendable. And it's, thanks. It, it's tough. I think it's also a decision. It was also kind of like the, the grass is, I, I know because of what I do, like the grass is not always greener yeah. that sometimes going through the rough spots are better than thinking that it's good on the other side. Mm-hmm. And that was probably something that I had some knowledge of because of what I do for a living that I'd seen people, same thing, you know, second marriages, and we'd see them get divorced. And I'm like, what are they searching for? Um, Maybe look in the mirror, maybe it's you. (laughs) But you know, it's that whole thing of like, like I said, there were elements of our relationship, we played really well together. And that's part of what stuck stuck with us that um, we would Yeah. And I think that's true for a lot of some first responder couples that like when, when you're off, you want to make the most of it. And so you play or you do things that connect as opposed to like, we kind of just avoided the difficult conversations um, because I wanted to have good memories when we were together. So while it's commendable, I think there was also some avoidance. A lot of times we see in this, we talk a lot about leadership and leadership within police departments. And, you know, as you said, you, you started to set boundaries for yourself. You started to, to mention, you know, I don't, I'm not going to be talked to this way. I'm not going to be treated this way. So as a leader, a, we'll say, for example, a police chief, he can start giving orders to his men. He can start giving orders to, to the patrolmen and everything. And, they're only going to happen if he has buy-in of the troops, if he gets them on the same page. So I guess how, when you started laying those boundaries, how did it, how did he take it at first? And then, and then what happened that, that caused him to eventually buy in to, to making the change? So I don't, I would say he probably didn't take it well at first and he would say the same thing um, because it caused conflict between us in a big way because I changed. And anytime something changes or the system of a relationship changes, then there's going to be conflict and a lot of uncomfortable stuff. So I would do things like, um, I remember I would tell him. So first of all, when I, when I set a boundary, I tell people what that boundary is going to be. I don't just be like, screw you. I'm going home. Um, so I'm going to say, I'm going to say something like, Hey, I don't appreciate the tone. 
Um, and if we can't have a conversation where we can be, you know, level, then I'm going to go take a break. And so the next time that happened, I would look at him and say, I'm going to take a break. And he didn't like it. I sometimes was punished for that. Um, I would get the silent treatment and I had to kind of say like, okay, this is a consequence of me having a boundary and he would eventually come around. Um, and he will, he will tell you like, we've had a lot of conversations about this. And now he uses this experience to talk to other people about it. He was like, oh yeah. So like when you did that and I gave you the silent treatment, I won, I won that argument is what it was because I'm giving you the silent treatment. And I'm like, wow. Okay. But I didn't see it that way. I just saw he was being an asshole. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it was that whole thing. So along the way, I started to also give him more grace. And so instead of like trying to hold his feet to the fire, I was like, hmm, that's not really working. So then I started to have more grace. And I would say things, I started using feeling words. God forbid. And so I started to say things like that really hurts. Or I would simply say things like, ouch, and I would leave the room. And when he started realizing that he was hurting me is when he started realizing he had to do something different. So that was probably more impactful. I also do something with my eyebrow. And if you're listening, you can't see this, but I raise like the one eyebrow and I kind of do this thing. And I started like giving him the look or I said, would you like to try that again? And he'd be like, oh, um, shit. Okay, hold on one second. And he would figure out how to say something different. Um, but it was also me deciding like, how can I help him to be the man he wants to be? And in that, then he realized that he had gone off course of who he wanted to be at his core. Um, and as he started to realize that is when he, and as I started to use more feeling words with us, between us, um, he started to use more feeling words. Now they weren't, you know, really, you know, mad, sad, glad, anger, frustration, you know, those kinds of things. Um, but that was really what changed our relationship is I started talking about how I felt rather than trying to hold him accountable for his actions. So through, through that, I know we, we mentioned, we're talking about connection earlier too and what what did you do during this time to try and keep that connection there to, to keep that connection going so we wound up inadvertently doing something that Gottman recommends and it was only later that I he and I both realized that this is really something that kind of impacted and helped our relationship which is established established rituals in our relationship so when he was off um, or when we could have time together, we had what we called porch time. We have a back porch and we have a front porch and we like to do a lot of porch sitting. And so it might be that he was had a cup of coffee and I had a beer and we'd be sitting on the porch and we'd be talking because of shift work, you know, and not really seeing each other. Or the other thing that we started doing was saying, um, hey, I can't wait to sit on the porch with you. And, or we would say things like, hey, when we get to sit on a porch, remind me to talk to you about blank. And so the porch became this like safe place for us to be able to talk about hard things. Hmm. It was, it was a time where it wasn't like in the middle where he's getting off or going on shift. It wasn't like when he was getting up and sleepy and trying to get a coffee down his throat. Um, it was kind of like, hey, we're going to go sit on the porch. And in our, that wound up, that ritual wound up being like, okay, now is our time to kind of unpack whatever we need to unpack. Hey, last week when this happened, that was really hard for me. I'm really kind of pissed off, you know, or whatever we needed to say. And sometimes we'd have those difficult conversations. I remember one time there was a situation that happened at work where he felt like he really disappointed his chief, his chief like shamed him. And we wound up sitting on the porch and he just started like tearing up. And I had never seen my husband cry in all of those years. And I was like, what the hell do I do? There's tears. I mean, um, so, but that was a safe place for him. He knew that that was the time to, uh, that he can just unpack things. And so having a ritual is really important, a ritual to find time to connect to find a place to be like that best friend that you need. And, you know, one of the things that first responders do a lot of times is they're like, well, I don't want to burden you. 
I'm like, it's more of a burden for you not to share what the hell's going on. Because many times we feel it like the vibration or we're experiencing it in moods. It's way easier to trust that we can handle it as spouses. Like we want to support you. We want to know what's going on. So you're not protecting us by, by like keeping us out of the loop. You're actually causing more harm than good. So ha- making a time, having a ritualistic time, um, by the way, research shows that those conversations are more effective with a beverage. I am not joking. Beverages are important or you can do food, but I, I prefer beverages. Um, so having a beverage is really important. <laughs> Yeah, very nice. There's your beverage. A um, Phillies mug. <laughs> so having a beverage and just sitting and talking, um, but talking about stuff that's meaningful. And that means that you have to open up and share stuff that's hard. And your spouse has to open up and share things that, that's hard. And having empathy, standing in each other's shoes, listening to that instead of giving advice, instead of fixing it which are kind of first responder things to do. Two things you said that I just want to stress that, that I think are super important. And number one, and I'm glad you said this as a spouse of a first responder of a police officer is that a lot of times I wouldn't want to share things that were bothering me because I didn't want my wife to know what I had to deal with. I didn't want her to know that I had to experience those type of things. And I didn't want her to know that things like that happen in the world that close to us. Mm -hmm. So it's great to hear from the other side that you would rather hear those things and, and um, be, be empathetic to them rather than deal with us and what happens to us as we try and bury all of those things down inside. Yeah. Number two is the importance of, having that connection time together, that time that you set aside to just be with one another and whatever your, your place is, whatever you like to do. Um, there are definitely times where you know, I was crushing overtime and it was more important to me to, you know, make sure the car was clean and the lawn was mowed and do the overtime and, and the yard work and everything. And I didn't prioritize that time. And I think we have to make that time to connect with our spouse, a non-negotiable part of our week, work it into our schedule, block out that time. That's a time that I'm not going to take over time, no matter, unless I get forced in or whatever happens by, by my choice, I will not affect that time that, you know, it's a, it's on the calendar, you know, when it's going to happen every time. So there's no excuses to not have it. Like I said, unless you end up getting forced or ordered in or something like that, that's something you, you can't control, but but making sure you dedicate that time. That's uh, super important. And one thing I always like to get people's advice on trying addressing problems before they get too big. So for, for you, what, what advice would you have for maybe a first responder listening? And they're afraid that they're starting to go down that slide of whether, whether it's shiny object syndrome, or they're starting to realize that they're, relationship is really starting to change, they're starting to lose that connection. They realize something's wrong, but they have no clue what to do. What would your recommendation be to them? The first thing that I thought of is if identifying what's not working. So, and I don't mean, and I don't mean like analyzing the relationship, but what are they missing? What, what's the hole maybe? Um, and having some self time for self reflection, like who, how are they not showing up in a way that they want to show up? How have they gotten away from who they want to be as a person? Person, you know. Um, sometimes I think of like the moral compass that so many of us as first responders, like we look at that moral compass and we look at like where am I going? Where do I want to be? Um, I have a compass activity on my website too, where it's a little bit broader than just a moral compass, and it's like. Hey, are you on the path that you want to be on? And if you're not on the path that you want to be on, simply saying, I'm not on the path that I want to be on is enough, right? So the easiest way to say those things are state, say you're feeling, what are you feeling and what do you need? I'm feeling lost. I need some help with direction. I'm feeling lonely. I need to feel connected to you. 
like just finding the feeling, what do you need? And you don't have to have the answers, but you do have to think about, okay, what is it that I'm wanting or what is it that I'm needing in order to um, start moving in the right direction? So um, it might even be, I feel lonely. I need to feel you naked. You know, sex is very important in a relationship. And if we're talking about relationships, that's really important. Um, I have... I have a couple and they established a ritual where it's like, um, if you come home and I don't have underwear on, that's an open invitation, wake me up. You know, so there are these aspects, like we have to talk about it as couples. We have to have those difficult conversations and we're weird. Like some, for some reason, we'll talk about sex, but to everybody else, but our spouse, by the way. (laughs) So Um, So that's probably the easiest way. I don't know if that kind of answers the question. Um, But that's probably the easiest way to start um, is to look at, am I, am I on the path that I want to be? Am I grounded in who I want to be either, either as a first responder or as a spouse? Um, Is my relationship going where the direction I want to go? Am I showing up the way I want to show up to my kids? That's another aspect. Am I a good dog owner? Am I a good pet owner? Or when I go home, do I say, oh my God, get out of here. You know, it's like you didn't get an animal to yell at them. Probably that's my guess. You probably got an animal because you want to cuddle with it or pet it or play with it. Right. So are you showing up in the way you want to show up? And then, like I said, it's state your feelings and what you need. You said, I don't know if that helped. And I don't know if you noticed here for those of you that are, that are watching on audio platform, I was, I was jotting down, I was writing notes and everything. I get, I got about a page and a half of notes just on this conversation, the things I've been writing down and everything. So that, that was perfect. I, you know, so much of it is key. And I, I love how, you know, like you mentioned, it starts with some personal reflection and realizing am, am I, and I love that because I'm a huge extreme ownership guy. What do I need to do to, be the change in this, in the situation, in this relationship, what can I do to get it back on the right track? And it all starts with that self-reflection. So, so that is huge. I, I, I love that. I think that people are going to get a ton of value out of that. Right. Ryan, Ryan, I want to real quick, you, you, you actually brought this up and it made me really think about it. Cause uh, I love how you always bring up the goals and the solutions. Like what is, what are you trying to get to? You can't get to where you're going if you don't even know where you're going. So, and I'm curious what Cindy thinks about this, that, um, we all have to go into our relationships with, with a, a goal of where do we want this to go or what, what do we want out of this? Why am I in this relationship? You know, for me and my wife, you know, I, since I was a little kid, I mean, I'm a romantic comedy fan. I remember being like 10 years old and watching like a kiss at the end of the movie. And I'm like, I want that one day. Like just how it was. So, but, so I think about that. My wife now, like, I don't want to just be married. I want to look at my wife and be in love. I want her to be proud of me. I want her to look at me and say, wow, what a great husband I have. Uh, you know, what a great, like those things are important. And not to say we're perfect. I'm just saying those, and we've had struggles and challenges too. We've been in uh, therapy a couple of times together. Uh, 2017, we had our third kid was a very challenging year for me and us together. But I guess that always what brought us back. Like, this is what we both want. We have to find a way to be honest and open and figure this thing out. Totally agree. Uh, You hit on something that I was doing like on the news. Um, You hit on something that's really important, which is, I think, um, like be in love, but also, you know, that's not a feeling, right? It's a thought, it's a belief, it's a experience that you have, but I don't remember what you said exactly, but like admire, respect. Um, One of the most important to me, most important elements of uh, what, what Dr. John Gottman talks about is fondness and admiration is do I feel, do I admire and feel, I hate this word, by the way, fondly um, towards my partner and does my partner feel the same way about me? That is the grounding to long-term relationships. And so are you acting accordingly? Do you, are you feeling, um, are, are you admiring your partner? And if not, then there needs to be, have a conversation. Um, or do you need to change the way you're seeing them? But most of the time that fondness and admiration is so incredibly important. And that's really what holds couples together. And I think as first responder couples, many times we do admire our spouses, our, our um, you know, our first responder as a, sp- as a spouse, we admire our first responders for what they do and how they show up. And if we can have that vice versa, and it really is a good underpinning um, for a relationship. Hmm. I love it. 
What what an amazing conversation, Cindy. I'm I'm so glad. I, I have so many more. Like I could, I'm looking at the clock. I want to keep going. I mean, oh, I know. I I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> this is so passionate. A, a bill for a therapy yeah. session. <laughs> yeah. No. This this and then this is and real quick, right? This is the value, and this is. I mean, I look at this show and why we did this and having Cindy on is. I mean, this is if there's a first responder that's sitting in their patrol car. I know so many, or or an EMT or a veteran, whatever, and you're sitting there. And you're like, yeah, that's me. I'm doing that. I feel shame. And, and like, you can make the changes. It doesn't have to be forever. You can figure this thing out, be accountable. Like Cindy said, be self-aware and start to make changes. The only thing that won't guaranteed is not going to happen. If you don't address it, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Sorry. Love that. Thank you. So I know the big part of this podcast is that y'all are retired. And what really interested me is that y'all are looking at the aspects of what happens when it's gone, right? So throughout this whole entire podcast today, we're talking about, you know, the relationship. And I think it's important to remember, like, your job is going to end. And that relationship and where you're going is going to be there. Um, It also, I love the fact that you're prepping people for retirement. My husband retired last year and I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. But as a mental health professional, I kept like watching him. I was like, is is it going to fall apart? Are you going to like, is all the trauma going to hit you in the head like a wave? Because that's part of what we need to be aware of when people retire, when we get still is when our brain starts remembering all the bullshit. It's when we start experiencing it. It's like, it gets quiet and the brain's like, Hey, you want to think about this thing? That's horrible. Um, and unfortunately we have a higher rate of suicide. Well, there's a high rate of suicide when first responders retire. And so we need to be aware of that. So not only do first responders, not only do first responders lose their identity, like they lose their tribe, right? They lose their family that they go with, but there is like a weird cutting off. Like you are no longer a part of us. You're kind of a part of us, but like, yeah, you're the retired guy. You don't get it anymore. And there's like this weird, like, oh, you can only get it if you're like in it with us. Um, and my husband actually went back to his department and he's like, I am a total outsider six months in. And it was because they hired him to go back and do firearms training. And he, he went, he didn't have the same status and that really messed with him. Um, it, that loss of purpose, it, it is so great. And so while there seems to be like this, oh my God, I can't wait to retire or, this idea of like, God, this is rough. I know I need to retire. It's difficult because once again, I mentioned in the podcast, there's grief. There's an incredible amount of grief that happens. Um, and, and kind of, like I said, a loss of purpose. And so that's why it's so important to have something else outside of first responder world, something else that you're all doing that I loved some of the questions that y'all asked me in prep for this interview, which is like, what do you do? Who are you beyond just a counselor, right? Or who am I beyond just a firefighter or an officer? Um, You have to have that diversity as far as who you are because life goes beyond this. And it's such a fallout. Um, As a spouse, I can tell you it's been really difficult as well uh, because he's changed a little bit for good, but then there's also these elements where I really liked the alone time. And now he's here all the time because he's retired guy, but I mean, it's, it's different. It's, it's impacted our relationship and it's challenged our relationship because we've been trying to figure out what this looks like and what's our next step and what we thought was going to be like, Oh, this is going to be fantastic. We're like, wow, we have a lot of time left on the calendar. We better figure out where we're going. Um, So it's, um, it's, it's challenging. And I just want everybody to understand that there is grief, there's potential trauma aspects, there's relationship, um, impact on relationships. And while some of it can be really positive, you also need to be aware and be really honest. If you're struggling with the negative, have those difficult conversations about like, Hey, I think I feel lost. I think I am sad. I think I am. Um, I don't know who to be friends with anymore now. Because for a long time, my friends were just like people who were first responders and got me. 
but now those people don't accept me and my other people don't get where I was. Mm -hmm. So I'll get off my soapbox now. That's good. And to, to that story, to that thing, uh, everybody is in the same boat. And I think it's easy to think that it's just me or it's happening to just me. I went through it. I know Ryan went through it. Everybody goes through it. You're just expendable. I mean, really the mission goes on. You're, you're not. And I was one of the guys that think that, oh, they're going to miss me. They're not going to miss me. They really don't care. Yep. You know, we yep. just had a retiree. I've been gone 15, 16 months. We just had a retiree breakfast. Did I get invited? No, I didn't get invited. They have a shadow box. They gave me as a retirement gift. I haven't been there in 16 months or whatever. I still don't have that. So it happens every age. They're not inviting you back. Uh, they don't mm -hmm. value you enough to do that. So it's just, you can't control that. So you can't get mad about that. Focus on your family, focus on yourself. So I think that's great advice of me. Well, thanks for bringing me on for an encore for that. <laughs> Cindy, I normally ask our guests for a book recommendation, but I'm not going to do that today because I'd like you to share uh, share a little bit about your book that you wrote for our audience and also where we can find it. Uh, so the book is called Hold the Line. Now, I let me tell you first about the book and then I'll make a comment. So the book is called Hold the Line, The Essential Guide to Protecting Your Law Enforcement Relationship. And what I did was I put all the information in there that I wish somebody would have shared with me that I only found out over A, research, B, experience, and C, my own knowledge from my training. And so that little trifecta, most people don't have that, right? So. Um, I put everything in there as to, hey, this is all the stuff that you probably don't know. You probably don't talk about the psychological impact of the job, how it impacts it impacts connection, it impacts intimacy, it impacts your friendship. And so I took the impact, like this is the impact, I took the theories that I know that make a positive and strong relationship and said, this is why it's jacked up. And then I said, hey, and here's how you fix it. And so it's all the stuff in there that I wanted somebody to share with me. Now, I have, my virtual assistant is a military spouse. And she's like, Cindy, everything in that book applies to me. Everything in that book applies to our relationship. I have firefighters, I have EMS and paramedics, I have um, nurses, I have all kinds of first responders that look at that and go, this is not just for police. I'm like, I know, but those were my stories. I don't have stories of being a, a paramedic spouse, right? Or I don't have stories of being a military spouse, but I had stories of being a law enforcement spouse. And so that's why I tailored it that way. Um, but everybody who's read it in first responder world are like, all the things, all the things. Um, so I share a lot of my stories. I thank my husband all the time for allowing me to put our relationship out there so other people can learn from it. I really think it was a vulnerable thing for him to do. And if you meet him, he'll be like, hi, I'm the asshole Cindy writes about in the book. <laughs> um, and so he's, he's really kind of funny. Um, so that's it. Now, where is it? It's on the cheapest place to get it is Amazon because it seems to always be 35% off. I like that. <laughs> that's a good place to get it. Uh, but you can also get it uh, uh, like most online retailers, so Barnes and Noble or uh, Walmart or whatever you want to do. So yeah, I also have a well right now. Right now, it's a free workbook that goes along with it on my website. So if you go to holdthelinebook.com, um, there's a free workbook right there. There's a free workbook, and I'm I'm only going to have it free through like July probably because I've had it free for over a year now. So I'm gonna. Uh, charge five bucks or something in the future. Appreciate that, Cindy. So first responders, go to Amazon, 35% off and buy Cindy's book. We're not going to let Cindy off the hook, though, Ryan. You know that, right? I know we're not. We're not. But Cindy, we play a game to close out the show. It's called Five Questions. Are you ready to play? I, Are you willing I'm, to play? I'm willing to play. Let's go. Do All it. right, it's a rapid fire game. All right, we're okay. Don't put a lot of thought into it. Just All first right. thing comes to your mind. And if there's Woo. a cool story to go with it, right. sounds very Freudian. <laughs> Bet we know you love to travel. Cindy's a fan of the show. She loves to travel. You and your husband, best place you travel to? Um, I would say Neve, Italy. 
How do you spell that? N E I B E. Okay. Why did you like that? It is in the countryside. It is beautiful, small little towns, uh, lots of different. We love the wine region there. We love the food there. We've made friends there that are Italian. Um, but the first time I went there, I was like, I feel like I'm home. I don't know why. And every time I'm like there in the hills and the beauty, it's just so peaceful and wonderful. And the people are just super nice and kind. I love that feeling when you go somewhere, you're like, ah, oh, this feels good. Cindy tipped us in a little bit. She has a forgetful brain sometimes. So what is the most embarrassing thing you forgot with somebody close to you in your inner circle? Oh, close to my inner circle? Oh, ooh, Somebody you, that's important to you, you shouldn't have Birthdays, forgot. things like that. Honestly, probably the most embarrassing that's not my inner circle is like I've forgotten like a kind of appointment and went and did something else. That's probably more embarrassing. A lot of my friends are like, uh, you know, Cindy. Um, so yeah, probably like birthdays, things like that. I'm, I'm pretty good as far as the embarrassment part, but yeah. Okay, uh, I, I like it. Leader who has inspired you the most? We know you love leadership and good leadership principles. Um, from since I was a child, Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm, awesome. Wow, that's, that's good. Okay. We can't have you on here and not ask a relationship question. When did you know you were in love with your husband? What, what point? What date? What oh, point? gosh. Um, that's a hard question because it wasn't like a love at first sight thing. Um, he was probably my, my brother was the one who said, you are different with this guy. What is it? And I was somebody who was very, very guarded. And so it wasn't until later, honestly, okay, here's the deal. I got off a plane, I can tell you exactly what it was now that we're talking about it. Yes. Um, he flew me, he flew me to Baltimore. Uh, he lived in Baltimore, I lived here, that's a long story. Um, I knew his sister who was here in Texas. And so he flew me through Cincinnati to Baltimore I got stuck on the runway and it's snowing. It does not snow that often in Texas, if you don't know. And he had asked me, he said, well, bring your winter coat. And I said, I live in Texas. I don't own a winter coat. I just go from the car to a building. I'm not gonna be wandering around outside. So I show up, it's snowing in Baltimore. He's there, now this is prior to 9-11. He's there at the gate um, and he has roses for me. And he says, I have something else for you, but it's, we gotta go and I'll, I'll give it to you. And I'm like, okay. And so first of all, the roses were beautiful. We then get, um, and, <laughs> and we, um, he has this package for me and it's from Nordstrom. Whoa, I don't want to hear about like, packages. Sorry. I'm like, <laughs> and it's from Nordstrom's and I'm like, whoa, you fancy Nordstrom's. And so, cause you know, I was still eating ramen and um, he, I opened this up. It, it is a car link coat, leather, black leather jacket. And it fits perfectly. And I'm like, how, what is this? And he's like, well, you said you didn't have coats. And I'm like, yeah, but how did you know to, to like the right size? He said, I found somebody in the store that kind of looked like your size and had them try it on. And I had never had somebody, I'm gonna get teary eyed. I had never had somebody be so kind and so thoughtful to me, ever. And it was then that I was like, this guy is different. And so that was probably when I was like, oh, I really like you. I really like you a lot. So, yeah. You could turn that into like a movie, you put some music. <laughs> I love that, that's a great story. All right, any job, this is a fic totally just fake question, but any job in the world you could do, take away money, resources, where you'd have to live at, whatever. Take this a little little girl, Cindy. What job in the world do you, would you still just, if you could do it, you would do it right now? Uber instructor. Oh, awesome. but, but for but for like the, um, what do you call those elite guys? Like for the SEALs, that's what I would do. The, I'd be a scuba instructor for the SEALs because I didn't realize when I was younger, I used to be a competitive swimmer and I didn't realize that there was something I could keep doing with water the rest of my life. And I'm like, yep, I'd be a swimming instructor and a scuba instructor for the SEALs. I've thought about that actually. Mm -hmm. 
that's pretty cool. Maybe maybe we could uh, make it could happen one day. You never know. That's not too impossible. Cindy Doyle, thank you so much. My questions. You did awesome. Thank you. Cindy, again, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I got a ton of value out of it. I have no doubt that our listeners are going to. And like Chad said, I could sit here. If we could ask questions for another hour and keep this conversation going. But we know you have a full schedule. Um, just uh, finally, where can our listeners connect with you online on social media? Uh, social media, I'm on Instagram. Um, at and So Facebook and Instagram is code4couples.com. Or code4couples, that's my... So it's C-O-D-E, number four, couples. Um, so code four, like running code four, right? Or code four. Um, so code four couples on Facebook and Instagram. And then on LinkedIn, I think it's Cindy Doyle. So C-Y-N-D-I is how you spell my name. I thought I'd be clever when I graduated high school and changed my name to <laughs> C-Y-N-D-I. So there you go. So that's how to find me. Awesome. Well, it, it's been a pleasure, Cindy. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. For all our listeners out there, we're on YouTube, we're on Apple Podcasts. Find us, follow us, subscribe to the show, share it with a friend if you got value out of it, and we'll see you next time.